Thank you so much. Uh, I would like, of course, to start by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present today uh, one of the new programs for sequencing diversity, which, you know, considering how the problem is uh, any any help that we can get in that sense, it will be very much appreciated. But I would like to specifically thank uh, Daniel Forham, who has been, of course, the force behind this effort, which I hope it will be very exciting for, for all of you. So it's it's very clear that that we are in a, in a complicated situation because uh, it's been already described that we are in the sixth max mass extinction of a species. And this time is because of us, because of, of human pressure in many, many fronts. There is a clear decline of species out there, which I'm sure that future generations will tell us what we did wrong to not stop that. Um, IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, which is one of the most respected and recognized uh, institutions that allow us to monitor and, and fight this decline uh, has already described that there are tens of thousands of species threatened with extinctions. Uh, there is a particular threat for amphibians. This is something known for a while, uh, and you will see why I'm making that remark towards the end of my talk. But clearly, not just animals, I mean, plants and, and, and on a, other kinds of uh, forms of life in Earth are, are, are suffering this, this drastic, drastic, dramatic uh, decline. How do we fight that? Well, there is not an easy solution. If, if there was an easy solution, that would have been solved by now. And I am one of the strong defenders that such complicated problem, which to make it even worse, every case is different. Not all the species, not all the territories do have similar solutions. So these kind of complex problems do require complex solutions. And there are many initiatives out there in the world. Our university is one of them, but there are many more trying to think globally as one planet, one health or planetary well-being. The idea is that this is a multipolyadric uh, problem and different assets needs to be accounted in order to promote the, 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 the preservation of biodiversity. Uh, we need to take actions from economy perspective, from ecology perspective, from social perspective and also from genetics and genomics as well. I want to be very clear about that. Genetics are not or is not the ultimate solution to the preservation of biodiversity. However, I think we, as a, as a, as a genomicist, we have a lot to say and a lot to add into this, this problem. It has been shown, and there are many, many of good examples out there, how genomics for the biodiversity can help, again, help not solve uh, this complicated problem. Studying the diversity of a species, uh, it's very important not just to have an assessment of how good or, or, or healthy is that diversity at that time. It tells us about the population history in terms of, for instance, episodes of inbreeding depression that might result in, in, in an increase of deleterious mutation. It's very informative about the taxonomic and the management units that are the target to preserve when there are limitations, as always, in which targets are prioritary over others. So all these characteristics in these slides are something that I think genetics can be very, very informative in and yet another factor to promote the, 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 the preservation of biodiversity. So let me just for a moment, if you if you if you allow me to 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 bring you all to my territory, which is the the, the great ape genomics. Um, there's been a, a long tradition of working in genomics of the apes. So everything that you see here is not, of course, everything that has been done in the field. Um, but um, but but this is just to illustrate that there is a long road ahead when. We start with the first description of the whole genome of a species. In this, case, in this case, the chimpanzee genome was first published in 2005. There's been many other apes published, many upgrades on, the, on, the, on, the, on, on this species, and plenty of population data. And in my opinion, it is this combination of the starting point with a good 
Excellent Reference Genome Assembly plus the population data and informative markers. It doesn't have to be whole genome, but it can be DDR, RATSEC or many other methods is are the key in order to make informative decisions uh, about these species. And I will just highlight two very brief examples that we have working in my lab. One, one, the one from Franzen et al. is an example of how we make use of ex situ informative decisions to help uh, people from sanctuaries and zoos to uh, have informative markers in their population to help them to make informative decisions of, of, on, on exchange of individuals. And then the second one is essentially working with non-invasive samples um, uh, on, on wild populations in Africa in order to develop geolocalization uh, for unknown samples coming from illegal trafficking in order to have uh, a map uh, to, 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 to quantify and regulate if we can uh, this big problem still for, for the great apes. So nowadays there are many initiatives that, that are uh, luckily for all of us and they are complementary and even if we had more more will be welcome uh, in order to take a genomic picture of the species that we have today. Maybe the biggest umbrella is the Earth Biogenome Project, which most of you know about. And, and there are already hundreds of partners trying to sequence the life on Earth today. But then uh, there are also uh, taxon uh, uh, groups like the Vertebrate Genome Projects. Uh, and then there is the Territorial Project, like the Darwin Tree of Life or the ERGA, the European Reference Genome Atlas, or the one that we are running in where I live, the Catalan Initiative for the Earth Biogenome Project. So that's the reason I'm, 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 I'm really, really ecstatic and, and, and I would like to share the good news that Nanopore would like also to contribute to that uh, in a different way because that's not a consortium. Essentially, this is a non-centralized effort in order to allow researchers in the world to generate uh, uh, Nanopore data for a species that are in critically endangered according to the red list. The red list is a list that was developed by the IUCN already uh, 50, more than 50 years ago, and it's really, really informative about the trends about populations, uh, census, and the fate of, of, of a species. Um, uh, uh, this is now in a pilot stage, and we are starting um, um, with this critically endangered uh, species. But, but um, as you will see in the next slide, there is already a lot going on. And I encourage, of course, everyone to contact Daniel uh, if you would like to inquire, inquire questions about this program. So in Barcelona, we have been very blessed to be part of this initiative. And I would like to stop for a minute and acknowledge these key people because they are very relevant. First of all, Ivo Gut, the director of the National Sequencing Center in Barcelona, and Marta Gut, who has been really, really the brains behind a lot of the experimental parts of this project. Mark Palmada here in the center in blue. He's the PhD student that has been doing the computational work. And then Laia, Armida, and the people of the, of the genome assembly and annotation also at CENAC. So when we, when we were given the opportunity to start uh, a pilot phase, we selected nine species, which uh, uh, very critically uh, we had in the area uh, a, a zoo that thinks in, in, in a lot of terms in, in terms of conservation, and they, they, they have started for two or three years a very big project on biobanking and cryopreservation, meaning viable cell lines on a lot of species. And so we decided to start with these nine species for which we have good snap frozen fresh tissue or cell lines already available. All of them, of course, typically are critically endangered and, and it contains some mammals, two birds and two amphibians. So pretty much in this is what you can do in two months, considering that August is typically a holiday in Spain most of, most of the month. And still it was really fantastic to see how much you can do in, 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 in a, such a short period of time. You can see that between usually getting the sample ready, sequencing an assembly and, and, and the assembly ready, there is just a few uh, let's say a couple of weeks uh, at most, which it's really, really fantastic to see this rapid generation of high quality genomes. 
in terms of computational, um, um, what we have done is some of the standards of the of, in the field, doing some pre-QC, then fly, and then polishing, and finally removing uh, aplotics. And, and pretty much, and of course, it depends on the assembly, because you will see that it's not the same an amphibian genome size than, than a bird genome size, but pretty much between a week and 10 days is what it takes to finalize uh, these assemblies. So in terms of data production, and again, I want to be very clear about that, our starting material was good enough to have higher molecular weight DNA, which allow us to get a, a read N50 that was usually in the tenth of thousands of base pairs. So you can see that the range is between 20 and 40 kilo base pairs, which this is really good in terms of then trying to assemble uh, the genomes. So this is a summary of, of the genomes today. You can see that for most of the genomes, we have a Contic N50 that goes between uh, 30 and 50 megabase pairs, which is quite remarkable. And then the blue squares are the production data that we generate. I want to draw your attention to that peak that is off the charts, uh, and that's because of, of Calitriton, the, the, the newt, that being an amphibian, you will see that the genome size is well over 20 gigabase pairs uh, estimated. So just to provide some particular examples of what can we do now, because the whole idea, again, is to help communities to generate uh, the first genome, and then um, um, those communities should be able to gather around that genome and work on, uh, with conservation efforts. Um, the idea is, for instance, we have first this, this spider monkey genome, which the Contic N50 is pretty much over 50 megabase pairs, which is quite good. The largest scaffold is 140 uh, megabase pairs, um, but um, um, this is uh, achieved with 40x of sequence coverage data. Um, what this is useful for is, of course, combined with another project that we are running where we have tens, even hundreds of individuals resequenced at high coverage that allow us to do very deep population projects that allow us to investigate conservation aspects on all these species, right? And considering that we can use cross-species mapping, that is very informative, not just for spider monkeys, you have seen, but also for macaca nigra, and to get new informative decision based on whole genome information on, on, on all, all these genomes. So let me, let me show here another example, which is how we can use this data to upgrade previous genomes. So this is the blue-throated the blue macaw, which essentially um, and had an Illumina genome before with a, a lead of, of, of Nanopore and BioNano. And we generate first a totally de novo data with um, Nanopore, with, just with Nanopore, and you can see an N50 of over 40 megabase pairs. Um, in this case, though, when combined with the previous gen genome assemblies, the first column is the Illumina uh, uh, genome, the second one was the combination of Illumina, a bit of, of Nanopore and BioNano, the third is our Promethean, the new Org1 uh, genome, and finally you see the, 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 the combination which, uh, uh, as you can imagine, the new genome is really, really, really useful in order to fill the gaps and to reduce the context and, 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 and hence, as a result, to have a, a much better assembly. So let me finalize with, with uh, a the genome, which I think it starts, at some extent, some of the project for Org1. And I, again, I want to thank Dan, because he was the one believing in this as one of the iconic species. So what I'm showing here is the Monsen newt, Brock newt. It's, it's a newt that live in only in a very specific mountain, very close to where I live. You can see the kind of vegetation and rivers we have. The problem is that a few years ago, there were just in the hundreds of species. Now this program, uh, this, this, this newt has been included in, in an European life program, and there's been a lot of, of breeding and reintroduction. Again, here the Barcelona Zoo have been very much involved into that. And now the population is growing and it is now in the sense of 2,000 individuals or so. But that's still only 2,000 individuals and in, in a region that is 
very, very uh, visited by, 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 by humans because that's the closest high mountain to Barcelona city. So the pressure, uh, it's really high. And, and, and this indeed has, has had an impact in the, in the creeks where these, these animals live. The problem, uh, well, and as, and as it is obvious, there was no reference genomes for this animal. And in fact, very few genetics studies has been done, mainly the mitochondrial and microsatellites. The problem of working with newts and salamander genomes in general is that their genome is colossal. I mean, it's, we are usually talking between obviously more than 10 gigabases and sometimes even above 30 gigabases of sequence. And this is because their genome, it's, it's, it's very full of repeats and, and other complications, which in fact are redundancies that, that result in a very, very large and complicated genome uh, for which only long-read technology can help us to, to solve that. So this is, this is something in progress because, as you can imagine, just assembling the genome, it's really complicated. Um, we generated uh, pretty much close to 20x coverage of a given individual. Um, the N50 is at the megabase scale, but again, this will improve when we will be, we'll have the resources to finally polish and improve uh, the, this genome. But still, this is really useful because just having these scaffolds and this level of context and this continuity allows to do a lot of beautiful, beautiful stuff. For instance, the, this, is, this is our collaboration we are having with Salvador Carranza and Adrián Talavera. And essentially, we are generating a lot of short read data from uh, pretty much will be 200 animals, a lot of DD rat sec, but there will be also whole genome information. Um, we went and sampled the animals from all the major creeks that we know they are determinant for the genetic diversity of this species. And of course, we are starting now to see some patterns and some, some, some data that will be really, really crucial, we hope, to monitor and take informative decisions how to best restore that, that beautiful animal in, in this specific area. So with that in mind, um, um, yeah, something very important. Um, the Org1 project, uh, uh, its, its nature is in collaborative efforts. So the whole idea is to gather together a group of people that contains people in the field, that usually is the people providing the sample, sequencing centers, people with uh, know-how on computational genomic assemblies, and then, of course, population genetic and conservationists to implement real data for the real world. And everything is done in an, uh, in an open access. Everything is included in an online database. So all the genomes that you have seen today, when will be ready, they will be uploaded. Some of them, like the spider monkey here, they are already online. So when, when we are uh, uh, just getting the data, the data, the raw data is also there. So the idea is again to, to excite a community and to engage a community and, 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 and to promote uh, even further studies for all these species that if we do not, if we do not, do, don't do something for them very soon, uh, they will just disappear. And again, that will be a loss of, in this case, genomic and biological diversity that will be gone forever. So what's next? Well, um, um, in the next month, um, we have already some species that we are really excited to generate and, 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 and just to create the genome assembly. Uh, we will go beyond the vertebrate clade and we will, uh, in this case, include uh, two mollusks and one insect. And there will be some fishes out there that will be really, really, really interested. And finally, there is this reptilian, which we didn't have any reptile on this first phase, but uh, 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 this will be the first reptile that, that we will do here the Barcelona team. So all in all, I would like, of course, to, to congratulate, particularly again, Daniel, but everyone involved in this idea of the Org1. Again, this is not a competition. I think that we are all together in order to promote and expand the idea of taking genomic pictures of the biology there. 
Um, I want to particularly thank the Barcelona Zoo for uh, uh, believing in us and, and believing that this is a good idea that should be pursued and they were very active provi providing samples. And also, of course, particularly Mark, Mark Palmada, which has been working a lot not just to have genomes in time, but also uh, he's uh, one of the best advocates for this and many other projects, the people at CENAC and, and many other people involved in, in, in this work. Thank you so much.